We want to welcome everyone to Season 3 of the Shared Pains Podcast. Over the last few months, we've re-engaged how we reach out to our audiences, as well as how we gain feedback from you, the industry. Over the last few months, we've hosted roundtables across the world with people attending with different perspectives and have gained great insights about the things that challenge us every day. We want to invite you to these roundtables and gain insights from like-minded peers within our industry. To gain information about these roundtables, please head to the Construction Progress Coalition website to register for these events. Without further ado, Season 3 of the Shared Pains Podcast. It is almost impossible to assemble a building on site if you're not assembling that building in architecture. It's just how much you're incentivizing subcontractors to prefab together. That's where you gain efficiency. The best project managers we knew were the the guys that beat up the subs the most and could fix the problems that occurred after they occurred and deal with all those things better than anybody else. That's not the game anymore. These are the true stories of the shared pains facing designers, builders, inspectors, and operators on our quest to streamline collaboration in the digital age. Find out what happens when industry and technology stop playing nice and start getting real. We are the Construction Progress Coalition. And this is the Shared Pains Podcast. Welcome to the Construction Shared Pains Podcast. My name is Sasha Reed, and as your host, it's my role to help all of us gain new perspective on the systemic changes necessary in design and construction to thrive in the digital age. Now more than ever, construction technologists and company leaders are aligning their standard operating procedures to produce the data insights necessary to guide business decisions in these uncertain times. On today's episode, we digest the terminology of prefab before debating if the reward is worth the risk. When owners decide that prefabrication is the new gold standard, will you be ready to deliver? Here with me is CPC's executive director and our not so roving reporter, Nathan Wood. There were definitely um, some good discussions at the uh, advancing prefabrication that I, I came away with. Let's also welcome back our industry voice of reason, Dan Smilillo, director of process and innovation at the Walsh Group in Chicago. For those of you that have fallen on hard times recently, um, I want to take this opportunity as a platform, as a representative from the Walsh Group to um, invite you to apply for positions across our organizations. We're looking for individuals to fill roles all across North America to help accelerate our organization as well as the industry forward. So please take the opportunity to go to thewalshgroup.com, look at our careers and our opportunities. A link will be located in the show notes. Okay, gentlemen, who do we have gathered to break down the language of prefab today? Dan, I'd be curious, you know, from what you've seen in the industry. I was thinking about this episode specifically. Person that might be better suited to talk about that is probably Brianna Williams. (laughs) You you want the sentence. Hi, my name is Brianna Williams. We've evolved. We're, 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 this is like, this is round two. Learn more about Brianna's background in season one, episode four. Were you still... Brianna Halfhide, have you were you Williams in our last interview? It was Bluebeam 2018. I don't think I was married it was, yet. Yeah, it was September. It was like right before you got married. So many changes, so long time. So where where are you now? I'm at Struction Site. As Dan would say, you've gone to the dark side. She honestly might be a better candidate to talk about all that stuff, what it should be, or what everyone's talking about. It's a good Mm. point. I had my name is Amy Marks, especially given her recent shift. I am head of industrialized construction strategy and evangelism for Autodesk. My dad was actually one of the first construction managers. He helped formulate the method of construction management. As a little girl taking me to job sites, he'd point out to me from the car and he would say, look at all those guys all together looking up in the ceiling. You know, that costs us money. That was flow that had stopped because they didn't have the answers whatever they needed, right? It wasn't thought out up front. Nobody understood it. And so how do I stop that from happening? 10 years ago, started Excite as the first prefabrication consulting company. Yeah, I worked with her at Clark Pacific. Such a great experience at Excite, being able to look into the leadership and strategy and operations of some of the biggest construction companies and and end users and owners on the planet. 
Wow, you, you are most certainly the queen of prefab. <laughs> <laughs> The title, Speaking Prefab, stems from presentations and conversations during the Advancing Prefabrication Conference in Dallas, Texas, which Amy has chaired for the past several years. I've been, again, practicing gratitude. Everything in my life hopefully has led me to the role that I'm at now. CPC looks forward to collaborating with Hanson Wade on future Advancing Construction events as they go virtual in 2020. This podcast would not be possible if not for the support of our member companies, including Autodesk, Struction Site, Procore, and The Walsh Group. Together, we are advancing digital collaboration between project delivery stakeholders through engagement, empathy, and digital literacy. Learn how CPC is transforming project delivery at constructionprogress.org. All right, let's digest then. When I hear people talking about prefabrication, you hear terms like volumetric, modular. Let's break down and really talk through what are the differences between each of these. At you ever see me at any conference, the first thing I do as the chairman or my keynote is I go over the offsite continuum and some of the language. So it's actually really cool to see and hear both Amy and Bree break down those five levels. So they start down at the left-hand side with um, intelligent materials. Anything on your job site that is a material that reduces drying time, curing time, waiting time, you know, something that comes from a factory that has been processed in order to reduce the amount of steps. When you think about prefabrication, you don't always think about the first part, the intelligent materials, like the actual Mm -hmm. components that that, kit of parts. Further right, single trade assembly, which could be like just your electrical whip or spool pieces, and like a, a light gauge frame wall. And then I moved further right into multi-trade sub-assemblies. And there are two types, non-volumetric, ones that are flat. And then there are volumetric is just your walls and you just stack them on top of each other, but your ceilings aren't there. Things like bathroom pods or skids where I can stand in them or on them. That's how I know it's volumetric. I can stand in them or on them. And then you can start dipping your toe into that modular world. The word modular means other things in other places. But for this specific industry, modular is your entire room with your ceiling ready to go. We're talking about, you know, the module has the structure in it to be the building. And you just stack them. I like to think of it as like the module is the chassis and what things can you change out and have flexibility on. And and it has hopefully within it, lots of sub assemblies and prefabricated components and intelligent materials. And that's where, you know, the chassis could really, could really take that somewhere. This is a continuum that most people have adopted over over the last 10 years. You know, depending on where you are. I mean, Singapore has their own way of saying things sometimes, but they're pretty close. You can use all of them or any of them, you know, or a combination of them on any of your projects, and they're they're not mutually exclusive. If modular is too specific of a term then, what what is that broader descriptive a title that we should be using. And so, yeah, Amy goes on to explain. The thing you want to think about that's really at the top of the hierarchy are the words industrialized construction, because there are lots of things that go within industrialized construction, including modular buildings and sub-assemblies, but also things like ergonomics within the factory or automation within factory. There's things like, you know, BIM within the factory, or anything that can happen in a factory that could be more efficient, right? I've heard other terms for it. But to me, that's the one that if you look up those things in the dictionary, right? Well, and th- thankfully, I have it in our notes here, right? Because we, we did yeah. look up industry, you know, the economic activity concerned with processing of raw materials in factories. So let's put, the, let's put the word factory in italics for a minute. Factory could be a factory that is away from the job site. It could be that we did a rapidly deployable solution. Things like factory in a can where we're roll forming on site. Look at what Mace is doing in London. That top floor, you know, they, they have the flying factory. If we can get more people into these factories, how does that change the way in which our society works? If we were to look up factory, I'm sure it has something to do with uh, under a shelter, like doing work within a shelter. I would actually push back on that. I feel like yeah? if I had to define a factory, I think it has to be in a controlled environment. There's a like process within that, right? There's tack time within that. There's a flow to that. There are standard operating procedures at different locations of that. There's a material management flow for it. You've seen a lot of subcontractors, or a lot of general contractors throw a bunch of guys in a warehouse. That's a shelter, but it's not a factory. And while you said that, I did end up looking it up. And in factory says that uh, the main point is that it's, it's assembled chiefly by machine. It's more about the process than it is right. the, um, the, the conditions. 
It's funny how this all comes together, right? Wow, <laughs> we, we, we are both understanding this it's, so much better. <laughs> it's almost like I've thought this out before, you know, exactly. <laughs> Between the AEC professional and technologist, is it possible for us to speak the same language? That has been the last year of me getting into software. Construction has their own language and software has their own language. And half the terms are very similar. I hear people using terminology in ways in which I don't understand what they're talking about. The glossary is so important because if we don't level set, then people have no idea what I'm talking about. And we use these words interchangeably incorrectly. As we move into the debate section, we have to ask ourselves, what are the potential risks when implementing prefab? The biggest issue we have in the industry is rework and time wasted due to rework. So when you're going that modular route and you change something, even just a couple inches, that can throw up the whole spectrum of modular construction. We have a very project-centric based industry. It's like a Hollywood production every single time with different people, different subs, different owners, different project managers, even when you work for the same client. We have very little learning that gets captured and put through to the next projects. And when you bid things out and you change the players all the time, you ha you're, you're getting less and less learning. We're getting less and less you know, information to have a baseline. What software doesn't understand is this very complicated balance between the 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 WIFM, the what's in it for me, mm -hmm. the company level, and then you've got everything happening outside at the project level, restrictions and the requirements that are very valid excuses. I like that quote. Uh, oh, from man. John McOmer. Virtually man. everyone in the construction supply chain works on contracts where the incentive is to maximize their gain at the expense of others. Still kind of that... Uh, I like to use the Amazon analogy when Amazon was trying to find their headquarters too, it was the race to the bottom. You know, who was going to offer the biggest incentives for, depending who you are, a minimal payout of jobs in the area? A race to the bottom. That's crazy. Why is that? <laughs> uh, isn't that isn't that the point of this episode to figure out? <laughs> <laughs> a lot revolves around standard of care. Um terminology of standard of care, if it's going to take me three weeks and uh, longer to complete this task and you're going to sue me for this, but it takes everyone else that same amount of time, well, you can't sue me. It's the standard of care. Dan, have we talked about the, the spearing gap? Because you, you mentioned standard of care. I have not. It comes from AIA and, and is, is sort of like a contractual legal term. The Spearing Doctrine in 1918 was a U.S. Supreme Court decision, and basically it was the first one where the general contractor uh, used late changes in the design plans as sort of their claim for losses and damages, and it established this contractual line between the designers, the, the liable designers' standard of care, and then the responsible contractor's duty to those contract documents. Any confusion or gaps or uh, mistakes between those two is becomes the spear and gap, which is really the opportunity for change orders and and how contractors you know make at least through the seventies and eighties and still today have have made a lot of their uh, additional profits is through that change order process. Yeah, I mean that's that's the industry in a nutshell because I can't tell you how many cases I've heard X design was delayed, caused us delays, but therefore due to standard of care, you can't recuperate your losses. So if you're going the route of prefab or modularization and somewhere down the pipeline, there's a drastic change, whether it's a VE owner change. Which is, I mean, that is the explanation of McLeamy's curve, right? To, to move all of that thought process of how we're actually going to procure and construct it, which I, I learned from uh, our friend Danielle DeBuncio that uh, it's not actually McLeamy's curve. It's Boyd C. Paulson, who was at Stanford. And, and this was, goes back to 1976. This was kind of the original cost influence that still looked at the separate lines of engineering design to procure and construct to utilization between engineering design and procure and construct is our boundary of realization. And so you've got a, a decreasing uh, level of influence as you move across the project timeline. The theory that again has existed since the 70s, but we still continue to struggle with. Anybody that doesn't agree that you should bring everybody up front in the process, including the superintendent who is always, you know me, that's my favorite person on the job. Oh yeah. I always say, if we're not making that person's life easier, we have failed, period. No one makes money unless that person's life is easier. You have to design differently in order to be able to prefab effectively. And, and that really right. is the shared pain. 
it is almost impossible to assemble a building on site if you're not assembling that building in architecture. What separates DFMA, Design for Manufacturing and Assembly? Let's just say first that that does not mean prefab. There will be very specific Design for Manufacturing and Assembly principles and guidelines, inputs and outputs that I, you as a designer need to understand in order to enable that downstream. And you can DFMA a project that's not even going to be manufactured. Like you can just apply DFMA principles to traditional construction and you're still optimizing construction. So yeah, 3D printing is definitely designed for manufacturing assembly because it's, it's fundamentally a direct digital manufacturing and extrusion. You know, we tell people they have to be more like manufacturers. And I think right now they shake their heads and say, yeah, we got to be more like manufacturers. It's safer. It's more productive. You're right. We need to be more like manufacturers. And then they walk out of the room and they say to their buddy, what's a manufacturer? We rarely bring in experts for pieces of this puzzle that we don't understand. There are plenty of things that are manufactured on this planet. And there are tons of manufacturing experts from other industries, as well as within our own, that you can just talk to before trying to figure out your, yourself. If you talk about, what is it, Steph Curry, you know, the basketball player? Mm-hmm. You know how many coaches he has? He has a two-minute coach. He's got a free-throw coach. He's got a three-point coach. And, like, think about us in construction. So we should, like, use, you know, Steph Curry's example. Like, there's a coach for everything, right? They, yep. they may not be your head coach, right? But there's a coach that knows how to do a very specific skill set that you want to be great at. And you need to have them all, right, yeah. if you want to play like him. So now as we start to move into the decide portion, how can new methodologies like Lean and Agile support prefab adoption? Most industries went through this boom, through this lean revolution a long time ago. Construction's late to the game. There was a lean history that is underlying to all of this. Are you familiar with the like formal definition of the four industrial revolutions? No. The, fir- the first uh, industrial revolution was kit of parts. Interchangeable parts. I like that. The second uh, revolution was in the 1910s with the assembly line and standardized work through Henry Ford. That concept was was then evolved with, into Toyota's production system in the 1950s. And then we yeah, come into Agile in the 2000s. That, that word Agile, it's, uh, it's really become something like near and dear to my heart because I feel like it's just a really simple way of saying we don't have an answer yet, so we're going to try something. We're going to see how it goes, and then we're going to adapt. Is there a difference between Agile and Lean, in your opinion? I think they're same, same philosophy, um, different application styles. Lean is, is the way you would approach um, something that's manufacturing or something that's construction, where you're building things, where it takes a little bit longer to you know, set it up. Whereas mm-hmm. Agile can be applied to tech because you can change things out easily, whereas Lean takes a little bit longer to, to make some of those modifications. Yeah, yes. and, that, and that's why we have that emphasis, emphasis on the boundary of realization between the two, because that's where you separate an agile approach from a lean approach. You can nope. take a, an element of e- each of these and, and leverage it in construction in a way that could you know, totally change the way our industry works. The whole culture in uh, Detroit of like the, the Mopar and yep. the parts you know, makers was like, you know, what, what makes you so special uh, when someone requested a change to a part? Whereas in Japan, you know, they, they had a whole supply chain that understood like, well, no, of course, if, if the person installing it isn't effective with it, that's a problem that we need to address. That's one of the great things about Lean. You know, coming up front and understanding where the risk is going to be and figuring out what those constraints are and solving for them up front and measuring that and tracking that. Where the challenge for any sort of a you know trade contractor, specialty contractor, whether it's MEP or Clark Pacific, that yeah, what are the things that are in your control? What are the things that are not in your control? Mm-hmm. What are the things that are consistent that need to be you know pulled through by demand? And what are the things that you batch of different various parts? Like you design the chassis consistently in in each car, right? There are certain things like you just said that are always going to be the same. That's the same for construction. Well, it sh- it should be. <laughs> it could it could be. It could Let be, me change yeah. that. It could be, it could be, but it's applying the right ones at the right times to the right places. What we always end up talking about on every episode. So it'll it'll <laughs> comes come right in on back. Point. Yeah, it always comes back. It's all about flow. So people talk about lean construction here because we borrowed it from lean manufacturing, but they don't. I rarely hear people really talking about flow. 
in order to successfully deliver prefabrication, what is the direct incentive for project stakeholders to change? So even if you had it designed that way, you then have to get past the pricing. Even if you get it priced that way, you then have to get past procurement, where now let's say there's only two companies that make operating room ceilings and they're good at it. Well, now your procurement methodology says I have to have five bidders. What do you do then? Well, and that's where IPD, you know, integrated project delivery is is intended to to close Spearin's gap. IPD doesn't always help, for the record, but we'll, we'll go oh, to that. Oh, oh, yeah. I, I can tell you. So, oh, I know. I know it doesn't. <laughs> yes, and it's easier said than done, right? Because that means you now need to go through all those what if scenarios of, well, when these things happen, how are we going to deal with it? Yeah. And if it's not really kind of figured out and understood, because mistakes are still going to happen. We're all still humans, right? And so, like, how do you, again, expose more of those design to procurement and construction yeah. uh, miscommunications and, and mistakes and, and make sure that you have those backstops earlier in the process before you go out and start fabricating across that boundary of realization? You have to really understand why you're changing and embrace that change in order to have return on investment. You know, the architects care about, you know, design and aesthetic um, and the contractors care about, you know, some consistency and having the ability to prefab some of these things. It's just how much you're incentivizing subcontractors to prefab together. That's where you gain efficiencies. You can't go from a a trade centric stick built design, if you will, and think you're going to get a kit of parts on site. I feel like this is the only example construction guys understand. When you have all of a sudden you're going to have an OSIP policy on your project and you ask for a, a credit back for insurance, how many of your subs are going to give you back 100% credit back on insurance? <laughs> the answer is none. Like they're going to give you back 40 cents on the dollar if you're lucky. You have basically said, give me a credit back for the place in which these buildings where you make the most money. Yeah. So whether it's the plant room or these bathrooms where you have a lot of trade stacking or a boiler area or like, you know, the distribution racks, you've basically said to these contractors, you know, oh, I'm going to go to these other supply chain partners. Prove to me that I should stay with trade instead. You know, the relationship I've had with you for 50 years. And then you have the same old, you know, bosses that are at these construction companies then posing the question, what's cheaper? The best thing that those contractors, those general contractors, contractors can do is say no to those yeah. subs and, yeah. and find a new supply chain. Cause what I believe the subcontractor will become the new manufacturer and they will rise up because they have all the you know pieces in place to become the new manufacturer. It's already happening and subs are driving some of these conversations. You could look at what, you know, Southland's doing. They're building their own framed rack. So they're doing the actual metal stud framing to put their stuff in a panel. Because they're like, well, I just, I don't want to wait for the drywall sub, so I'm going to panelize it myself. And then all these other, you know, MEP subs are saying, well, I want to get in on that rack as well. So now they're saying, well, come into our factory and we'll give you this space over here to do it because they see the benefit in having the other pieces, parts of the puzzle in place so that they can get further along. The issue is, is that there aren't too many you know, designers and architecture firms that actually have a deep knowledge base on what elements are possible for what applications and what manufacturing supply chain they can go and ask, you know, bring up front in the process to ask questions to. Owners cannot push down risk and think that risk goes away. That risk stack, you have to really talk about it and how to actually understand what these, the scope of these elements and how to, how much of it do they draw? You know, like, well, how far do they go down the line if somebody else is going to give them that information? And that takes a lot of uh, iteration, kind of back and forth, and it can be kind of chaotic, especially to um, engineers and, and architects that would rather just, you know, have it be done their way and, and kind of throw it over the fence um, and wait until they're completely done rather than letting someone else kind of look over their shoulder while it's still half-baked. Yeah, we'll complete this and by this date, by this time, when really everybody knows that's kind of BS because you're just trying to win that bid or do that design contract or that consulting contract. Uh, you're just trying to be that low person on the totem pole rather than be transparent and be honest with our design is going to take us this long. So at the end of the day, what are the key drivers of prefab success? What culture eats strategy for breakfast? Mm-hmm. You know, it's like you could have all the best learnings, but if you your culture is not uh, trusting, if your culture is not diverse, if your culture is not about learning, if your culture is not about sharing, none of this can happen. The first bathroom pods we ever did in the U.S. were for a hospital. And I was like, 
at the time promoting the fact that they were better quality and it was like, you know, less trade stacking and, you know, you would have less punch list. And of course these are all true, right? Like everything we're talking about is true, more consistency. And I asked the superintendent, what was the best thing about having these bathroom pods? And he said, well, the best thing about them was I got seven a day. And I was like, oh my God, that is the worst marketing ever. And then I rethought, I was like, well, tell me what you mean by that. And he was like, it was the only consistent thing that I knew about on this job that actually happened like clockwork. So he's like, I knew I was getting seven a day so I could schedule all the rest of my work that happened around those bathrooms because I was certain that I was getting seven a day. Like, prefabricating is not hard. It's everything around the fact that gets you to be able to prefabricate that's hard. Driving that is owner's expectations are changing. But I would argue that general contractors are more willing to change when owners ask them to versus just like the technologies out there. Owners have to collaborate to remove risk and take that on the chin with everybody else. You've heard me every year for 10 years talk about, stop asking if it's cheaper, ask if it's easier. HCA made a good point. The ownership got up there and said, listen, certainty is better than savings every time. And if that's true, which I believe it to be true wholeheartedly, partnering is much better. And I think you're going to see a trend in this industry in the next five to seven years where owners, and it's already happening, are asking for the same teammate and they want the same project manager from those generals and they want the same subcontractors for a series of jobs and they want to ensure that they're going to drive down the cost. Why? Because the learning stays within that group. It's not hard to prefabricate pipe. It's hard to create a process, a culture, and have leadership that enables you to prefabricate that pipe. Well, and what I love about the sports analogy, whether it's basketball or, or baseball, this whole money ball analogy, it, it, the reason that it works is because the organizations have clear standards that everybody follows. And, and that's what gives them clear data that they can run analysis and analytics and then all this stuff off of. And so much of yep. the problem in this industry is that we don't have every, you know, three strikes equals you're out or four balls equals you walk because <laughs> right. we, we, we have completely different rules from job to job. So it's like we installed seat belts because the standard of care back in the day was your head went through the dashboard. That was the standard of care. Then a regulatory body came in. Uh, I don't know if it was NIOSH or who came in and actually mandated all cars have to have seatbelts. A regulatory person decided that. Yeah, they didn't stop manufacturing cars. They inst they created a, a policy around seatbelts. Correct. Government changing is the final roadblock. It takes them the longest to do it. But when they do, it's, it's usually the one thing that finally gets everyone to adopt it. The future of construction data standards is not one size fits all. It requires input from myriad stakeholders to align our process and procedures across the project delivery supply chain. So there, there's a lot of uh, uncomfortableness and kind of cultural shift that needs to happen. None of it's bad as long as your behavior you know, is good and your intention is good. The Common Data Exchange or CDX Playbook supports digital literacy between disparate AEC professionals despite combative contract requirements. On the next episode of Construction Shared Pains. When I was in manufacturing, you know, there were times I could quote 18 to 24 weeks on some wire because the person I'm selling to is probably quoting 24 to 36 weeks. Rob Fisher with the Construction Users Roundtable and some familiar faces follow the money to redefine how we calculate the true cost of our shared pains. But it's it, it all boils down to communication and if everybody The Construction Progress Coalition is a 501c3 nonprofit transforming design and construction by addressing the shared needs of people, process, and technology. Learn how you can contribute to the future of AEC data interoperability at constructionprogress.org slash membership. This podcast is produced by Nathan Wood, sound editing by Dan Smilillo, and music by Riggs Productions. I'm Sasha Reed, and we look forward to seeing you here next time.